Hi. So one of the reasons the United States is having such a hard time politically is because so few people in the mainstream have been able to articulate the causes of a lot of issues in this country in a way that makes sense. And in a nutshell, the reason we're having so many problems here is because the post-World War II economy, which made the United States a creditor nation to most of the world, as well as a consumer-driven economy, was founded on a premise, or was driven by a premise, that having options is a good thing, and that capitalism, which provides more options for consumers, is a good thing. Now, it turns out that having more options isn't suited for a world that runs primarily on technology because technology seeks a single standard. Technology does not want a thousand different options. With technology, not only do you have the issue of security spending, which prices out most competitors, and on a, almost by default, creates natural monopolies. You not, you not only have that issue, you also have an issue where, for the most part, Aside from security spending, there probably is one best way of defending and advancing anything that runs on technology, primarily, where technology is the underlying basis. So that's right now I'm wearing clothing from two different, at least two different companies, and there's no, there's no inherent conflict between what I'm doing now and the idea behind Western capitalism post-World War II. And the reason for that is because as long as we're dealing with something tangible, like food or clothing, really anything, cars, as long as we're dealing with something tangible that's primarily driven by touch you know, and so on, you've got a justification for having a thousand different variables and a thousand different options or more because hum human beings are diverse. So it makes sense to have an economy that has, in fact, it's better to have an economy with a thousand different sodas, a thousand different you know, types of food, a thousand different types of clothing, a thousand different kinds of physical books, and so on and so forth. When we, when we start talking about technology, the argument becomes much less clear because there probably is one best way to write a piece of code in a way that makes it accessible, efficient, and more and the most secure. I'm passing by a school. There probably are a thousand different ways to teach somebody or a classroom and still make it work. You don't want to live in a society where there's only one way to teach kids. So anything tangible that, in, that involves human interaction. So capitalism succeeds and has succeeded as a result. Now, with technology, if you, let's say you want to pull up a survey, there probably is a best way to ask a question that elicits the kind of information that you want. There probably, at least in, in a particular kind of language, there probably is a best way to create an API or an, or an interface that allows communications to be both accessible and more secure. You don't need a thousand different ways of sending an email or a, me or a chat message. And that's because for the most part, technology post-World War II, it moves from physical things like nuclear power and nuclear weapons, and it moved into data collection. And when you move away from ta the tangible and into the intangible, there is probably one best way of gathering data that is correct and accurate as possible. So what we have post-2000 are the rise of actors that have maintained the ability to defend 
a technological standard and to make it, make it accessible to the most number of people. That explains why Apple, Google, in China, Huawei, uh, and so many Tmall, uh, Alibaba, etc. It's not a coincidence, the Andex in Russia. It's not a coincidence that these, Amazon, of course, in America, it's not a coincidence that these are the companies that have essentially, in, in a sense, almost supplanted governments. And rendered governments in not only a catch-up position, but in a position of not knowing how to regulate because they're not insiders. They don't understand technology. You've got a, an economy that now runs on data and technology being run by lawyers. And I'll give you a personal example. <laughs> right now, I have, if you want to file a case, you have to go online, sign up, and follow the prompts. Well, the idea that something as abstract and complex as a legal process is going to be efficient based on a series of prompts and include your ability to exercise all of your rights, or all of, all of, I should say, all of your potential legal strategies. The idea that you're going to be able to do that online, based on computer programming that prioritizes a series of prompts is probably not feasible. And so you end up in a position where you have human beings that can't necessarily change the system and, are, and yet are put into positions of regulating the system. And one of the reasons the technology has been so embraced is because it cuts down on theft, it cuts down on human mistakes. So when you're dealing with tangible things, like let's say dispensing medicine, you have to get the right dosage, you have to get the right number of pills in a jar or a container. Machines do a wonderful job of doing that. The minute you move into anything abstract, there are some serious issues. And yet, as of today, society in every developed country has decided that the loss of potential options in the abstract realm is okay because it's, it leads to more security and more data collection. And thus far, a lot of the conflict that we're having is all over the world is because we're stuck in this position as individuals where we're trying to get to a singularity of some sort. And what's really happened is at this in-between point, all we've done is create not a singularity of any sort of efficiency. All we've done is create monopolies. Uh, Alibaba just had an antitrust fine of, of X billion dollars handed down against it. And, you know, in this country, we haven't done such a good job of antitrust enforcement since Microsoft, but you can just look at the valuations of the companies I just mentioned, and you can see that they are essentially city-states, countries unto themselves. And Amazon, of course, has its own security team, both physical and intangible, and so on. And so there's a sense that a lot of the conflict is because we're in this halfway point where we haven't perfected a singularity. And also because we're in a position where for the most part, it doesn't look like we're coming close. And because we're not there yet, we're suffering a loss of both discretion, independent judgment, and jobs, especially on the manufacturing side of physical things. So that is, in a nutshell, a lot of the issues, a lot of the problems that are happening right now all over the world in developed countries in 2021. And that's why so many people have moved out of developed countries. They've, they've made their money here and they've gone to developing countries, less developed countries, because in those countries, the social contract and the intangible nature of life makes life to some extent a little bit easier and possibly more fun. Since coming back to the United States, I believe I came back in July of 2020. It's now April of 2021. Since then, I've had a few nice trips. I went to the Grand Canyon, but even if you want to, but you know, 
even if you want to go to a national park, you almost have to be a lawyer because you have to look at, all right, it's open on this date, the private tour buses, but not public ones that are run by the park. And at some point, if you switch over to an automated system, you can't get to a human being that can tell you what's going on, even though the National Park Service probably has some of the best employees in the whole world and the most competent. You just imagine, right, that if you want to be a park ranger, you're doing it for the love of nature and you actually care about what you're doing as opposed to, as opposed to doing it just for the money. So you have this a sense that, you know, having you have to be a lawyer or an insurance agent to really maximize your potential in developed countries, because for the most part, you can't automate law. And yet you need law in order to make technology work and be accessible. And what has really happened here, right, is, is let's say I mentioned the online filing system. Remember that you're now dealing with a private company that has to cooperate with a local county system and then local county employees in order to facilitate the interaction. At that point, because it's probably quite expensive just to have a local operation, the private company probably has to be at least available all over the state. You're probably not gonna be a small player if you get a contract with a county online legal filing system, at least not in a large, not in a large city. So again, it goes back to this idea of technology favoring the big, and the impersonal, and yet at the same time, necessarily requiring input from the individual and the small, the people who are being the, basically the end users. And because there are a million different variations when dealing with the, with, with the end user, in order to make these, these systems work, at some point, someone is going to get cut off. Someone is going to get shafted in a sense. And so, and right now we've decided that's okay because again, the gains are, especially the potential gains are massive. Now, if you think about say blockchain, right? Well, let's take something else, another example, medical records. I filed a dispute with my medical provider regarding a, a medical record that I thought was false, was incorrect. And I don't know if there was a hacking system or if it was just a different system that pulled up or maybe it was just a misunderstanding uh, because I'm hearing impaired. But the system in my the record on a particular date is incorrect. And I went ahead and filed, there's a system that allows me to file for a review and it was denied. It did not, it was not approved. And now, if you think about it, right, what does blockchain do? Blockchain protects you probably from, it reduces the risk of a straight hack. It probably does that, right? So if you have a, an online record system, it probably reduces, and you run it on the blockchain, it probably reduces the ability of that system to be hacked. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't ensure the human being that's entering data into the system is entering it accurately. It doesn't tell you anything about that. And so it doesn't really, you see how we're stuck now. If you want to have a system of 100% accuracy, you almost have to sacrifice your privacy. You just walk around with some sort of digital recording <laughs> device that then allows you to essentially dispute data that may be entered incorrectly. It just maybe the nurse was having a bad day. Maybe again, there was a miscommunication issue and so on and so forth. But these technological improvements are only going to reduce a hacking security issue, not human mistakes, for the most part, where you're dealing with data and not something intangible. So when you put all these things together, you can see why a more centralized system, where you don't have quite as many private players, will succeed to the extent that it maintains either jurisdiction or control over the dominant technological standard. And governments are uniquely positioned to be, to protect a technological standard. They've got the resources to do it, which is in this case, unlimited. And so 
if you have fewer steps, so in other words, if I go on in, in an e-filing system in China, I'm probably not dealing with a county, city, state, federal system. I'm probably dealing with a one-size-fits-all procedure. And that means that I'm not in a position where I have to know a million different local jurisdictions' methods of doing things. And as a result, my life is simpler. I don't have to spend you know, an hour a day trying to correct a record, trying to figure out what my records say, you know, making sure that all my policies are up to date, making sure that my continuing education is up to date and so on and so forth. And, you know, you just, you just think about the fact that if you have to be a lawyer to succeed, your life, is, your government's probably not doing a good job. And in China, you can also see that since they have probably established a secure technological standard. They can also make your life a bit more simple. Now, whether or not that gives you access to a diversity of choices on the intangible side, I'm not sure. But right now in the United States, you know, we have local, state, and federal laws. It's not at all clear if having more options is necessarily a better thing. Because for the most part, now the system is so complex, you have to be a lawyer to utilize it. And especially when you deal with things like ex parte applications and so on. I mean, just, just the notice, just the, how, to, how to serve somebody is in and of itself a challenge to figure out if you're not a lawyer, or even in some cases, if you are a lawyer. And so within that kind of a system, it's not at all clear that the lawyers who run the country who, are, who have been presidents for the most part, it's not at all, at all clear that they've created a system where they understand the technology and they're in a superior position to create a better and more accessible world for the average or above average person. Whereas China, of course, has clearly shown both the willingness and the capacity to create a middle class, and a society that doesn't have to deal with so many conflicting standards. And as a result, has gained credibility, just like Singapore did, and so on and so forth. And so, when you think about the fact that we have a lot of choices, what's really happened in this country is that if you go to the federal system, which is, again, a centralized entity, they've had electronic filing for at least, actually, let me see, at least a decade, right? much earlier, I'm imagining, I'm trying to figure out when I first joined the PACER system, more than a decade, right? And I don't think the city I live in, which is one of the largest cities and counties in the, in the United States, I don't think they've had an e-filing system for a while. But again, I tried to use it, and it's not intuitive. I had to stop, go to the courthouse, and file something in, by hand, in paper. And in federal court, you, you give what's called a courtesy copy. Uh, but you don't have to, I mean, the system is, at least 10 years ago, the system was amazing because there's only one set of procedural rules called the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And they make sense. They, they have things like voluntary disclosures. I think those are, that's 26. Um, everything in there makes sense. And, and it's also more simple. Over here, if I file in a local county, I have to look at local rules. I have to figure out what window to go to to file. Um, I mean, there's not just local rules. There's also, on top of that, I mean, you've got a lot of other things going on, right? You've got the civil, civil procedure, uh, and you've got the CCP, and the, the CCP changes every year, for the most part. And so, what you realize about the American system is that all these choices are there, not necessarily to make your life better in the intangible realm, but to create jobs, especially on the local level. And so rather than creating more options in a way that's more accessible, because the country has been run by lawyers, I mean, even the mayor of this city is a lawyer. And in fact, the guy he ran against was also a lawyer. What you're realizing is a system that favors complexity in order to seek out job creation. And that means that on, on some level, a lot of the economic growth that we've had in this country, especially you know, with respect to anything that's tied to education, or especially graduate education, not mathematics, not science, not engineering, anything that's abstract, 
on that side has probably not helped the average American or even the average European. And I know that even in Europe, which has some of the stronger privacy laws, you can't, you know, I think I tried to file as a tourist, I tried to file some sort of an appeal. It wasn't in, I don't think the entity was in Belgium, right? That's the headquarters of the EU. But they basically, and what I got was this idea that, you know, we can't really deal with individuals. You know, it would take all of our time if we had to deal with all these individuals. So what's the point, really, of having a legal system if all you're going to do is create complexity? Well, the idea is, well, jobs. And you want to maintain these educational systems that have, at least post-World War II through 1991, done a fairly good job trying to, trying to create or advance this idea of Western civilization. But if you're living in a society where you don't really have choices that make things more accessible, a lot of the economic growth and a lot of the existence of all these colleges that cost so much money, it suddenly starts, suddenly starts to look like a, a scheme that favors connected people. Which explains why I've heard about New Yorkers paying a lot of money to get their children in preschools. And to me, you know, being born, I wouldn't say middle class, I mean, I, 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 well, you know what, lower middle class and then eventually upper middle, middle class. To me, it never made any sense. But if you think about it in an environment where these economic gains have been propelled by essentially fake jobs, it does make sense. Because it's, if it's gonna be based on signaling or it's going to be based on this idea that my education, my diploma makes me better than you, or puts me in a better position to create a set of rules that regulate your life, it makes more sense in that sense. But, you know, I never went to law school uh, just because I thought I was better than anybody. I went to law school because I thought it would help me serve the individual. And if you look at most lawyers, I don't think they think that way, which is really odd to me. Because what is your utility if you're not in a position where you're trying to make a system more accessible to more people? And when you look at it in that sense, the East, the rise of the East, looks, in a sense, inevitable. Remember, it's not just China, it's Singapore that has essentially a single standard that allows it to make a life that's more accessible and more simple for people, which then allows them to live their own lives. Now, if you're in a position where you have to constantly, and if, oh, the COVID vaccine. So uh, I was able to get a COVID vaccine, but I had to get it from a public entity, and then they transferred me over to my private healthcare system. So now the public entity, I went back and looked, they never updated the records to show that I got a single shot, even though they sent me to my private healthcare provider. And so they even sent me an email saying that I canceled the appointment that I have with them, I got a two-shot um, regime. So then I had to contact a state agency employee and let her know what was going on. I had to call twice just to get that person's name. They wouldn't give it to me. I had to send an email, then get on the phone. This isn't really a life that makes people, <laughs> that makes it easier for somebody. And that, again, deals with records management, this is not something the blockchain is going to be able to fix. And so at the end of the day, when you put all these things together, there is a sense that the Chinese or Eastern executive-led system, in other words, a political system that favors the executive branch, the president, the prime minister, or the premier, is superior to the Western system for now. Because it can get things done in a way that doesn't require unnecessary complexity. And if you think about it in that sense, the idea of unnecessary complexity being a plague on your life and on society, it's inevitable that the East was going to rise and will continue to rise. And now that we've elected another lawyer, it's also interesting, or at least inevitable, that there will be political divisions and therefore social divisions in this country as we focus more and more, not on reforming this triple layer of government into an environment where you have a single standard, 
or at least one that seeks a single standard, you have chaos. So it shouldn't surprise anybody that the political system in the United States in the year 2021 was chaotic. That's all I'm saying. How is it going to get fixed? You know, remember that the tangible world can justify more options because not only are you dealing with human to human interaction, but you know, if I walk into a store, I'm walking into a grocery store, I happen to be going into this place because it's close by, I can walk to it. But you can have 10 different stores out here of different sizes, just because they have different products, they can favor different tangible products, they can advertise them in a way that makes sense, discount them in a way that makes sense. And that, of course, gives you a better life that's worth living, right? If you have a lot of different options, but not necessarily if you're dealing with a society that requires you to be dealing with paperwork and then following up on that paperwork, especially not in a unionized government system where government employees, for the most part, don't have very, very safe jobs. And as a result, are not incentivized to, I'm not gonna say do a good job, but are not incentivized in a way that creates an environment of promoting the best people. I guess I could say that. Put all that together, and again, the rise of the East is, is inevitable. The decline of the West is also inevitable.